Hey everybody out there, Dragnix here once again with another video for you all. This week, I wanted to do something a little bit different. In particular, I wanted to focus on something more specific, game design. Now, I've never been in the gaming industry in terms of using my degree in computer science, and I was a software engineer for six years who got sick of the company he was working in. The industry is a high pressure place that isn't my cup of tea given what I experienced in the non-gaming world. Lots of similarities in fact to the gaming world's current engineering portion, but I feel like with my background in terms of design and software, I really appreciate when I can see great design elements in terms of mechanics, but overall game design and working to a game's strength as well. This week I want to focus on the idea of working around and focusing around a singular mechanic, one that has complexity to it, but in the end comes down to one basic idea. And the game that I'm looking at is a game that I've been addicted to in the background for a while now. No, it's not Darkest Dungeon, surprisingly, despite my love for that game. It's something else. I'm not sure what's going on, but I came here with a question. And I'm gonna find the answer if it kills me. You see, at the core of Crypt of the Necrodancer's interesting take on the roguelike genre is an idea that many of today's game designers forget about when it comes to ideas and concepts behind designing their games. Obviously games are of all different sorts, from your platformers, to your RPGs, to your roguelikes. But within some games, some of the best designs are based off a single idea, a single mechanic, a single focus. And working within the bounds of that design, playing off of it left and right, altering its rule sets in subtle ways, but keeping the main mechanic at the core the same, you get a game that knows what it wants to do with its audience and knows how to hit the right points with it. In the case of the Crypt of the Necrodancer, you may think it's the most obvious element that there is to the game's namesake. The idea of the beat, the idea of music, or the idea of rhythm seems like the obvious one to choose here. But no, that's not what the main mechanic that I'm talking about is for the Crypt of the Necrodancer. The basic mechanic is much simpler than that. The basic mechanic is the controls. It's the movement itself. Now, before you think I'm crazy, other games have movement, of course. It's just a simple mechanic that's required in a game like this, right? But if you look at all the major elements of the game, from the enemies and attacking them, to the weapons and the items that support the characters, to the different characters themselves, they all at the core work towards the game's central movement mechanic. The guys over at Brace Yourself Games knew exactly how to perform to that one central mechanic, what to put in the game, and how to mold it into an experience that you'll be playing for hours on end, while still being open to new and experienced players alike. Needless to say, I've really enjoyed my time with the game. I'm here to show you exactly how it got its hooks into me, and how exactly its design elements work so well. So for those who haven't seen The Crypt of the Necrodancer, here's a brief summary of how the game works. Note the bottom of the screen and the heart. Your heart beats to a rhythm, and you move to that rhythm. You use the four directional arrow keys to move around the environment, and your job in every level is to get to the exit before the song ends, or fall down a pit to the next level. You have the choice of dying a horrible death to enemies as well, but personally, I'd avoid it without one if I were you. Now, there are enemies that you'll have to deal with, and you attack them by, well, moving into them. And that's where I want to stop and first focus on the choice of the attack mechanic. At this point in the design process, there could have been a couple of choices regarding the combat portion. What do I mean? Well again, this game has a couple of control options in terms of the systems that it's available on. It's got the keyboard of course, but if it's on the console, it's got the appropriate controllers. Now of course there's the one controller that a lot of people would think of when thinking about a game centered around rhythm, that being a dance pad, but remember, it's just a different form of the controller when it comes down to it. Alright, so let's go into the enemies. Enemies will always go after you in terms of movement of the beat. If you stand still, they will kill you eventually. But the thing is, walk into the paths of enemies, or have them run into you, and you'll take damage. From what I've noticed, the damage taken seems to be proportional to how complicated the movement pattern is, or how dangerous the pattern could be, with exceptions of course. Walking to the path of a blue slime that only moves back and forth on two squares a tiny bit will have you take a bit of damage, but a ghost that follows you may only do a tiny bit of damage. Now remember, movement is the name of the game here, and so what's the best way to keep up the variety of combat? 
Sure, you can add enemies with more health, which they do, or more damage, but to get the full experience of variety, you add enemies with different patterns of movement in, and that's where the big emphasis on movement comes in here. Now, what occurs is that you're playing essentially a duet with your partners being the enemies. Like I mentioned before, you are the dictator of movement here, and you control the pace in terms of movement in question to a certain extent. They are bound to the movement of the beat of the heart, and only can move when basically you move. So you're the lead in this duet, and you have the advantage at all times. Every enemy follows a specific movement pattern to a certain extent. A nasty minotaur? If he sees you in his line of sight, he'll charge right at you in a straight line. So sidestep out of the way, and get into position to hurt him when he stuns himself against the walls. Got a giant dragon that can kill you in one hit? Note that it takes him two turns to move a space, so dance to the space that he moves to, hit him, then retreat. You see, every encounter now becomes a ballet of some sort, putting yourself into the space where you are safe, but you can also deal out damage in. And what plays to this strength is of course the dungeons themselves. The dungeon is designed for hallways and semi-open spaces in question, changing up the rooms in terms of your layout a bunch during your travels. It forces you to react to these new environments appropriately with the different spaces in question, as you quickly determine what is safe and what is not. The thing is, you can deal with the layout appropriately though, as you can change the room's layout with your trusty shovel. Somewhat. Depending on the strength of your shovel, some walls can be dug, and some walls can't. And this plays into the scapability factor of combat, and the use of movement and non-movement to your advantage. With multiple enemies around you, moving into space can be very treacherous, as they can close in on you very quickly. But again, skipping the beat and not moving at all has a problem as well. You lose your coin multiplier, which is vital for getting precious coins to buy power-ups, especially in all level dungeon runs. But the process of digging takes a turn in itself, and the fact that enemies move when you dig something out, you can use to your advantage. You can hit a wall to not move, and let the enemies move while still retaining your combo. Again, you are in control in this case. You cause the enemies to move at your pace, at your leisure. Heck, it even works on walls that you can't dig technically, but you lose your coin multiplier for those. But notice how in all of this, it's once again how we're coming back to movement and the idea of control and controlling the space. You dictate the movement and your enemy's movement to a certain extent. In terms of design, what's also done very well here is the progression of the game, as it plays off the different themes of movement too. Now, this is really important when a game is so reliant on a singular mechanic. What do I mean? Well, think about games that you have multiple mechanics in. When a large change in difficulty of using a mechanic occurs, then you can have a player rely on a different mechanic to possibly balance it. Think of the idea of running into a physically immune creature in an RPG, and now having to rely on magic. But with only one major mechanic, you only have that to work off of, and so every adjustment and movement of that mechanic is vital, especially in terms of progression. As you progress deeper and deeper into the dungeons of Crypt of the Necrodancer, you start having the environment play off the themes of movement in subtle ways, but getting progressively more complicated. At first it's simple, letting you learn as you get used to the movement schemes and basic enemy patterns. But the game as it goes along, after you're starting to get comfortable, starts throwing enemies that will dig underground at you, explosive mushrooms that will blow up if you hit them. Still, those are basic changes on the formula that's there, just a little bit altered. But then, changes in the environment. Lava at your feet so you may burn yourself if you stay on them. Ice that will make you slide across it, affecting your movement. All these small touches make you think about how it alters your pattern of movement. What's safe and what's not. What patterns that you can expose enemies to, but keep yourself safe. Now, you may be saying to yourself, not everything can affect movement, right? I mean, the weapons have to be unique in some way. Well, they are. The weapons are designed to affect your movement patterns as well. There's a reasonable variety of weapons there, and they attack enemies in different ways. You start with the dagger, which you can only attack the enemy in front of you. You can also throw the dagger, which I end up never using, as a last resort type of situation. But it's the basic weapon that game gives you at the start. So let's pick up another weapon to increase my attack power or my range of that weapon, right? There's no downside to changing to, let's say, I don't know, a broadsword, for example, or a bow and arrow, maybe. The bow and arrow, for example, can hit any enemy that's in your line of sight of the three spaces of away. It's infinitely better than the dagger, right? There's a reason why Super Bunny Hop says it's overpowered. Until you realize what balances it. What balances that weapon is 
its movement. There's actually a movement cost of sorts that is hidden with the weapon. Don't believe me? Let me show you. Now, I could have used an in-game example, but I thought it was easier to visualize this with the scenario in question, so I went with this, for example. So, there are four skeletons, and the way the skeletons attack is that they move towards you. When their arms are in the air, they're ready to attack, but when they're at their sides, they won't. Now, in this situation, our hero has the bow, and you have to understand where the movement aspect comes in here. You see, if she goes down, she attacks the skeleton downward, but the skeleton on her right is going to attack her, so she's going to take damage. The skeleton on her left, for example, she can move towards him, except for the fact that she won't. She'll actually attack it, and thus she'll be hit by at least one of the skeletons to her right or bottom. Same thing with the upper skeleton. You see, she can't move in this scenario, and that's the key part. No matter what, she's taking damage in this scenario. However, think about this. If she wasn't using the bow and using the dagger, what exactly could she do? Well, if she, you know, goes to the bottom, she's gonna, you know, get hit by the right skeleton again. Okay, if she goes left, well, that skeleton's gonna hit her. But if she goes up, up will have the skeletons follow her, but she won't take damage. And the thing is, is that they'll be reset at that point. So everybody will move once towards her, they'll move up with her, but she'll be able to take care of one skeleton, in particular the one that came towards her from the top. And because of that, it looks something like this. This brings up the concept of positioning with weapons. Every weapon has a specific position you want to be in, and specific scenarios that you want to try to put yourself in for it. For example, the rapier, diagonal enemies are more of a problem for it due to the nature of the lunge forward of the weapon, putting you into danger of getting hit when going after another enemy. You see, what's missed in all the attacking and the ability to hit enemies and what the weapon does in its description is the fact that the weapon changes your movement style, specifically what spaces are now safe for you to move in and what spaces are not. But note the fact that the same basic concept applies, move to a space that an enemy can attack they will hurt you. Move in a direction where you attack an enemy with your weapon, you won't move. The basic rules have stayed the same and can be counted on. It's just an alteration of that rule set, and that's the, where the variety of gameplay comes in, where one can play the strengths of their type of game. But in the end, it still comes down back to that movement. You see, it's not only the weapons, it's not only the items. Take a look at the characters as they all have little twists on movement and attacking that changes up gameplay. Take Dorian, for example. He has the equivalent of cursed shoes. He moves two spaces at a time. Now, he can move one space at a time if he takes the boots off, but he takes damage every time he does it. To maximize his movement, you have to use walls wisely to be able to switch between the different tiles that you can move onto so that you can pick up gold or items or not get hit by enemies. Let's go a little bit simpler. How about Melody? She can only use the golden loot, which hurts enemies while she's moving, and not directly. So, getting boxed in? A major problem for her. In fact, it's pretty much death. So now, corners seem deadly in some way, and you really have to consider using the walls and digging through them, because if the enemy starts sneaking up in the meanwhile, you could be in a world of hurt. Or how about the monk? He plays normally, with one major exception. He's taken a vow of poverty, and so if he touches gold, he dies. And that once again screws with your movement. Now there's some spaces in the dungeon, and in particular, places that you have to consider where you'll kill your enemies. Hope you don't kill anybody on the exit of the map, or you're horribly screwed. But there's one character in particular I want to bring up because of the point that he brings to my conclusion regarding movement. Again, I'm saying that movement is the central mechanic in the game, and the fact is, the central mechanic still works to a beat, right? So how can I say that it's not the beat itself? And the reason I can say that is one character in particular, the Bard. The Bard doesn't have a heartbeat. In fact, he doesn't have to move to the beat. The way he works is simple. When he takes a turn, the enemy takes a turn. And yet the game's still focused on movement. It's the exact same. Like how you would expect a Bard to actually be. He creates his own beat as fast or as slow as he wants. And yet the core concept again stays the same. Don't move into enemy areas where they can attack, exploit enemy weaknesses and movement patterns. In essence, the game becomes as slow as you want it to, and lets you not have to react in a timely manner. 
And that's why the rhythm mechanic, while it definitely helps for the overall feel and enjoyability of the game, isn't the core mechanic. It's a supplementary one to help the core mechanic of movement. Take away the rhythm, the game still at its core still can play relatively the same. It's like they added that in for a specific reason, maybe to highlight what exactly the game's mechanics were truly all about. And on another related note, that's exactly why the rhythm of the song in terms of the custom import option can work so well. Again, when you have the solid mechanic at the core and that the song of the beat is more enhancing that overall, you're still working with the same solid movement and gameplay. Note that you can use a bomb though. Now, the game does give you a little bit of a helper here in case he gets stuck. The blood shovel will allow him to dig through anything at the cost of a little bit life. So when it comes down to it, everything in this game comes down to movement in some way. The weapons, the items, the characters, the digging mechanic, the attack mechanic, everything. And what's great about this is that the player may not even realize it. Sure, they may decide to pick up a certain weapon, or play with a certain character that plays to their style. But that may be if they prefer the synergy in which items and the characters work, or the little benefits in how they play in terms of weaponry. But you look a bit deeper at it, and you find that, hey, it's really truly all about the movement. And that's brilliant. That the game didn't need overly complicated mechanics. It didn't need a major second, third, fourth mechanic in order for it to really function. It had multiple mechanics, of course, but all that really enhanced the major mechanic that was at play, the movement system of the game. And if more games took this type of design from the get-go and keep with their core concepts, we may be seeing a lot more Crypto than Necro dancers in the future. Now, if you'll excuse me, I've got some more dancing to do. Once again, thanks for watching. If you like this video, like it, comment, and subscribe, or suggest other videos that you would like to see on the Tech Raptor channel in the future. I, of course, have my own channel, and this will be self-shilling for that channel, but if you want to see more content like this, just let me know. I thank you for watching and, you know, just enjoy games. Let's just enjoy games.